Welcome to The Lighthouse. Thanks for joining us today. I'm Dave Ahrens, and today we'll be talking about the conscious nature of the universe with my longtime friend, Clayton Vetch, who is a genetic engineer and a fellow armchair philosopher. Well, you talked about the two-slit thing. Tell me about that. So when a particle encounters a wall with two slits in it, yeah well they they started it when they started looking at that experiment they started with electrons and then over time they uh, they saw how it was functioning and wanted to try it with photons uh, and they both behaved the same way which is that they tend to be a wave in their nature because you see an interference pattern uh, behind the two slits, which is what you would expect if there was a wave coming out of each slit, then it, that would interfere with the, the wave next door and you'd get peaks and valleys and that's how you get your interference pattern. But when they uh, hooked up a detector and they were just shooting one photon at a time, uh, it behaved like a particle. And then that's what they say, you know, if, well, if you, if you observe it, if you watch it, it acts like a particle. But if, if you don't, then you get this wave behavior. So everybody's, that's, everyone's still out to lunch on what the the actual truth is behind that but that's fascinating yeah so if you were to take a body of water and drop a rock in it you would get a pattern of waves you know concentric circles it looks a little bit like the wi-fi signal on your phone those three little punching yep. and if you if those waves encounter a blockade with two slits in it you'll get two more of those little Wi-Fi signals coming out of each of them, and when they overlap, you've got high tro high valleys and low troughs in, in this pattern of interference, and that's what they see. Exactly. Yeah. So they're positive that they see wave behavior, but then when they observe the experiment or try to uh, capture, measure the... Um, the photons as going through one hole or the other that's what they see it goes through one hole or the other and makes not an interference pattern but two stripes and my my initial thought which i guess turns out to be old thinking in, in the uh, quantum mechanics world is that all right well that kind of proves that the universe uh, is is aware of our conscious focus and response to it. That's a leap. Tell me how you got there. Well, same experiment, two sets of results. Uh, if you're if you're watching it, it behaves like a particle. If you're not, it behaves like a wave. How do you know? What it looks like if you weren't watching it they record it and look at it later well they they put up detectors for photons in this case mm. and they only actually they only monitored one of the slits for some reason and so they could tell if it went through this slit, it, it, it would get a beep or a, you know record it and if it went through the other slit, they wouldn't get a signal. Hmm. Um, but that was enough to force the wave to collapse to a particle, is what they think maybe is going on. But the act of observing changes the results. And this is based on a, on a broader physical physics observation that you can measure the velocity, the direction, and the mass of a particle, but not all at the same, but time. not all at the same time, right. without changing it. 
Right. So the act of observation changes it. Yeah. So it's an interesting jumping off point. Um, but I, I think the universe is a conscious mm -hmm. universe that we we are more of a creator than we realize i think we don't we're not meeting our potential with what we can accomplish and get done i think we can we can do a lot more than we think we can and i think part of that is how this is a conscious universe and and we can it's it's set up to respond to us not just us but everything everything is a an actor in in this big play of energy and um, things coalesce and are created out of that zero point energy that's everywhere that's the energy of the vacuum of space and I think I think that Alien races, that's how they build their hardware, their ships, which have consciousness, too. They're, they're one piece when, you know, that's common thread between the stories you get to hear. Uh, there is no fasteners, there's no seams, everything is continuous, and in fact, they can heal themselves and they and they get entrained to the to the operator who's flying them and they're, they're designed to be genetically matched sort of with the operator so that you couldn't fly my ship i couldn't fly your ship <laughs> it's like memory foam yeah memory foam exactly that's handy could use that on my car actually yeah. So yeah, self healing, that's very cool. Yep, there there's some somewhere between uh you know they've got a level of consciousness apparently and they can they can communicate with the ship through their thoughts. That's how they drive the ship. <laughs> and that's how you contact them. That's how you ring them up is you just go into a, a meditative state where you try to raise your vibration and put out a signal and they'll hear you and uh then they'll be attracted to the to that vibration they'll be they'll be picking up like a radio signal and that's how they communicate is through consciousness and i think that's what dogs and cats are doing and that's what we're doing and we just don't know the extent to which we can do that but uh the aliens have got it down and they that's you know when they when they pick somebody up or, or you know steal them whichever you whichever way you go uh, that's how they all say, yeah, they, they just, I could hear them in my head and I could hear them in my, in my thoughts. So, well, I think it's, that's something we can, uh, evolve towards. And I think we are evolving in that direction. Mm -hmm. Um, do they have a concept of good? Yep, they do. They do. Hopefully they're leaning towards it. They are. And their concept of God, which they have, uh, is, is oneness, really. And they see us as very fascinating. It's a, we're a very fascinating side stop on, on the on their journey because we're stuck in third dimensional reality which is dualistic in in its nature and most of the universe is not it's fourth or fifth dimensional um, 
apparently. And and we're we're rising out of the our third dimensional vibration into fourth dimensional vibration right now is the it's what all the new agers are saying. I always thought of fourth dimension as three di three dimensional space over time. Like for example, the Superman logo has this big blocky letter is Superman, yeah. but they show it coming from you know like zooming over time as a streak, right? And so it's the it's sort of the this three D space in all time. Okay, yeah, that's I hear what you're saying. Um, is that accurate? What do you well, think of as fourth? I think it's different. I think some people actually use the term density, third density, fourth density, and it it relates more to your vibration than to a spatial aspect. So in in geometric terms in space time, yeah, fourth dimension is time, but in uh, in consciousness. It's probably better to use a different term, and density would be the one that I've heard a lot of people use. So, mm. so we're moving from third de third density to fourth density, whatever that may be. And there's you know, roughly twelve, but possibly infinite levels of of density. But eventually, you lose your body. After like the fifth dimension uh, or density, it can't sustain physical matter. It's all on the energy level. So there and above, you're in, you're into the uh, you you don't get to experience matter. Hmm. And we're a curiosity, and we give back to the universe. It seems, from what I can make out, that. Uh, other beings who have a higher density, a higher vibration, can't, don't experience life the way we do because we are, this is an unusual place in that it's of its dualistic nature, but that gives us higher highs and lower lows. Uh, it's, a, it's an emotional planet and they don't really get to experience emotion to the same depth that we do so um tell me about dualism okay well dualism is us and them uh right and wrong male and female gotcha uh black and white black and white yin and yang sheep and goats sheep and goats um, so we tend to be, uh, think in terms of like survival of the fittest because of our, uh, fight or flight, uh, reaction that we have, the, we tend to be violent actually. Uh, but good and bad, good and evil are good examples of dualism. Right. And, and we're, our whole society is kind of based around that with competition and, um, and what you have in a higher vibration system is is much more cooperative and you do things for the benefit of the most. What about the shareholders? Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the shareholders. That's part of the dualism. All right, so that makes sense. So you've heard about this Aspen Grove, I'll call it, that spreads over Central, Western, Midwest, in the U.S., uh -huh. and it's clo it's like a, it's a, it's basically a monoclonal organism. Oh, is it like a mushroom? Yeah, yeah, like a mycelium. It's a very similar. This happens to be a mostly above ground. I think actually, I think the mushroom wins the the fungus as far as being one of the most massive 
organisms on Earth. Yep, I heard that. And uh, at least for for trees, it's very obvious they have photosynthesis, but they also have um, they the leaves turn. Everybody has a house plant that they have to turn every now and then, so because it automatically turns to face the sun. Mm -hmm. And the leaves do that too, but then there's also hormones, which is sort of a, I don't want to call it crude, but a, a, a not, perhaps not as rapid mechanism. Humans have hormones too, and then we, we evolved electro, or sorry, neurons that travel, excuse me, communicate information much more rapidly over, say, a meter of body length, whereas hormones kind of dissipate along. But trees have really, really pronounced um, diverse responses to things like pests eating their leaves, and and the hormonal response to that can travel through the tree, right? And to the extent that they have defense mechanisms, you know, and they you know fire those up. Yeah, I've heard that that though, if there's a like an illness in in the tree, then. One, one or more will will be sacrificial and try to absorb whatever the bad thing is in the soil, or uh, they'll kind of sacrifice themselves and they care for the young. I've heard too with this, like I think it was the Secret Life of Trees. Yeah, that's right. Where, where they they're they have a society that they take care of themselves. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's cool. There's a branch point between actually right inside the animal kingdom as animals branched off from plants and it was the sponges and the jellyfish that were the first up on the animal side. And both of them had rudimentary muscles and nerves those, those showed up first and uh i'm assuming that the hormones came prior to that while they were still joined as is like just early primordial life it's fa very fascinating though to um you know long before we had brains or anything we had neurons and muscles mm -hmm. to respond to stimuli mm -hmm. and get the hell out of dodge or chase that prey or get away from the predator um Neat stuff. How do you? How would you uh, extrapolate that to universal concepts, like universe concepts? That is. I think it's all around. I think it's in everything, even the rocks. Even the rocks yeah. sing out. Yeah, I think I think the rocks have it too. Uh, a consciousness. No, it's pretty amazing that. They got all the their particles are zipping around at really fast speeds, and yet they're just solid as a rock. They certainly got longevity going for them. Yeah. So I think uh, what's m most interesting to me about this consciousness, conscious universe, is that uh, we have a bigger role to play in it than we think we do. That's my opinion. Uh, and two, two sources I've heard this from is that, you know, if you, if you understand how it works, you can, you can work with it and get good results. And, um, in one case, I heard a story Greg Braden was t telling about a time that he went with his Indian, Native American Indian friend to pray for rain during a drought in the 90s. And he said, I'm going up to our sacred circle. You want to come join me? I'm going to pray for rain. And he's like, yep, I'm there. And so he got there and uh, took his shoes off, took his socks off, stood in the circle, uh, gave thanks to the ancestors and the six directions, and uh, 
and Greg Braden was expecting like dancing or singing or something like like that and uh, that didn't happen uh, it was just quiet for a time and said are you hungry well you want to go for lunch and he's like yeah but I thought you were going to do a ceremony yeah. he goes I just did and I said really what did you do he said well I felt I felt the mud in between my toes and I felt the rain hitting me hitting my skin and I gave thanks for the abundance and the rain and the water and I, and I used as many senses as I could to experience uh, the rain the, that the rain has come it's already um, it's here it's not you can't think that it's you can't pray for rain or you won't get rain because you're you're telling the universe that it's not raining but if you tell the universe thank you for this rain that I'm experiencing it says oh you want rain okay <laughs> And they got flooded, and uh, it, it was too much rain. And, uh oh, uh, but it, it so that was kind of interesting to hear how to work with the energy of the universe through intention. And I heard the same thing from Jetta Molly, who said that. The sea of awareness is what everything flows out of, and things come from um, formless into form through the sea of awareness, and it's duty bound to work with you whether you know it or not. And when you're harboring fear or doubt in your thoughts and intentions it undermines what you're trying to accomplish on the positive side so if you see yourself hitting obstacles along your path well it's going to respond to that and give you the obstacles that you're asking for um but if you have full confidence and you know the outcome is going to be this, and both of them said that, you start at the outcome, start where you want to be, and go from there. You see it as already happened, already manifest, and it's going to work with you. Wow. So, that's a, that's a positive message. Yeah, I, I think that's not too far off from how it might work. Now we're just going to use this on the presidential election. And yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. That's very, that's very, that's uplifting to think that we have more of a part in it than maybe we realize. Yeah. The world can be a hopeless place sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of bad juju out there. Yeah. A lot of people say the mind is the builder, so learn how to... how to... if there's thoughts that are not serving you, don't let them make a nest in, in your head. And, uh, mm. Just let them go right through, but the ones you do want to nurture, you know, you can be intentional about your thoughts, which lead to actions. Sure. So, most well, people say the mind is the builder, and I think that's in line with the same idea that we can have an effect, and our internal state is going to 
uh, be a big factor. And in your even in your your regular health, it, I think you can heal yourself pretty much of anything if you can, if you've got the right focus and you know if you were you used to go to the shaman and the shaman would do his thing and you believed he, that it was working and it worked but uh, I think you can do it to some extent yourself too and I think you would do it in the same way you just see the outcome and be thankful for the outcome you see and uh, things will go easier <laughs> I think yeah. Why Posi not? Why yeah. not? Positive attitude. It won't, yeah, it might not work every time, but I think it won't hurt. Yeah. <laughs> the best we can do is lean towards the light anyway, so. Yeah. Yeah. But Chedamali will tell you, like, don't, not even a little drop of doubt in there is going to screw you up. So watch out for, for doubt and fear Those are, that's the big advice from her I'll have to read up on her she's tough tough to find her get her stuff um, oh why is that it's expensive oh uh, paywalls yeah she teamed up with a really good company that produced her CDs with music of particular vibrations that she wanted to, to be in there that would be helpful. Uh, in f she would teach by describing a topic and saying how it works, like willingness or... Uh, allowing willing and allowing is one chapter that i really like and uh, she says you have to be willing um, for a new experience and you have to allow that uh, allow it to happen so she'll talk about that for a while and then she'll do a guided meditation and then in the guided meditation the frequencies are uh, are pretty specific to help attune your own your vibration as you're doing the meditation. Mm. So I, I love her stuff, and I like the format. Um, you would really love it, I think, because you know, there's it's like one one chapter is on light. So expansion, light, and harmony are what she says are the basis of the universe. That that's the nature. It, it, the, the, the nature of the universe is expansion, light, and harmony. Hmm. And out of that, the sea of awareness is, you know, that comes out of that. And, and that, to me, I see that as kind of the zero point energy that's all around us. That's a leap I made, but um, it's a hell of a starting place. Yeah, I I love to play with this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yep. That's fitting for me. My name's Clay. You want to make something of it? <laughs> <laughs> well, most definitely. Yep. Thanks, Clayton. Great talking to you today. Oh, my pleasure. It's always good talking to you.